Louisiana Legends is made possible by Blue Cross and Blue Shield of Louisiana. This important program series enables us to discover, through the accomplishments of our fellow Louisianians, the unique character of a state so proudly served by Blue Cross and Blue Shield of Louisiana for 60 years. Marsha Ball, the brilliant pianist and singer, whose voice always sounds like it's emerging from clouds of smoke. It just has that dusky quality. Marsha is, I, I have a question. When you play before this enraptured audience all over the country, sometimes in Europe, do you ever ask yourself, what in the heck is a lady from Vinton, Louisiana doing at this piano tonight, enthralling all these people? Yeah, I always wonder, how did I get here? <laughs> what happened? Um, I think the um, lure of applause must have struck me at my first piano recital. <laughs> I think everything I did after that led me to this place. I would agree with that, but I would add I think it's the drinking water in that Vinton area. Now folks, right out of that few miles between Vinton and right over the border into Texas, in addition to Marsha Ball, Gatemouth Brown, George Jones, Janis Joplin, Clifton Chenier, Johnny and Edgar Winter, all out of that area. And the Big Bopper and Lazy Lester and Lonnie Brooks and Lefty Frizzell. What, why do you think that geographic, very humble, small mass of land, what, what, what is it? Well. I'm not sure. I asked Mose Allison one time, who went to LSU and um, cut his musical teeth in this area, uh, if he had ever been around there. I said, that's where I was from. He said, oh, honey, I learned everything I know over there. Really? <laughs> there was something, first of all, there were a lot of joints. There were a lot of honky-tonks, so you could uh, hone your chops. But a lot of people that were just born there came out of there with so much soul and, then, and so much music in their souls. I don't know what it is. When did you first become aware of Janis Joplin? Her first records hit me like a ton of bricks. Um, and then to find out that she was from 35 miles from my hometown, I, maybe that's why I was so affected by what she did. She came out of a blues tradition. You know, she made no secret of the fact that she loved Bessie Smith. And that was something at that time in the mid 60s that we were just learning about the roots of the rock and roll that we liked so much that you know that it came from people like Muddy Waters and Bessie Smith and Ma Rainey and she was one that gave it back to us. Is it insulting to ask you earlier we talked and you said you you do a fair rendition of Janis Joplin would you do a little? Sure. Oh I'd love that. I've been celebrating a an anniversary in the business. This this song was new when I started <laughs> playing.
like you are the only thing Yes, and didn't I give you nearly everything, baby, that a woman possibly can oh, Honey, you know I did And each time I tell myself I think I had the pain But then you hold me in your arms And I'm singing once again I want you to come on, come on, come on, come on and take it. Take another little piece of my heart now, baby, and break it. Break another little piece of my heart. Yeah, 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 and I want you to have it. Have another little piece of my heart now, baby. You know you got it if it makes you feel good. What was uh, growing up in Vinton like? Well, it's the classic place that you say of it. It was a good place to raise kids. Yes. Vinton is about 10 blocks square, and it was my whole world for 15 years. Was there music years. in your family? Yes. My grandmother played. My grandmother was the daughter of a musician, and she played piano. And uh, my aunt played. Her daughter played piano. And uh, so there was music around the house but it was homemade music it was piano music and my grandmother played ragtime and songs of her era uh, tin pan alley era stuff and had a window box full of sheet music that i loved and my aunt played beautifully cocktail music gershwin and things from the 50s from the 40s and 50s and uh, when so they, did you start taking me, piano they put me in lessons when i was about five years old did they really mm -hmm. First did you grade take to lessons. it immediately well i always loved to play and like I said, that applause factor was big right away. So I knew I could uh, get out of doing housework and get attention if I was at the piano. You and know, we're an extraordinary theater. state. Can you imagine Faraday uh, producing uh, uh, Jerry Lee Lewis? That place My goodness. rocked. <laughs> yeah, and, and then Vinton. Well, and Mickey, Jeff Faraday gave us Mickey Gilley and, of and course, Jimmy Swaggart, and Jimmy Swaggart. who's a great piano player. and. And the other cousin, Jerry Lee. And Shreveport gave us a, a, a well, Peckerwood Hill really gave us a Jimmy Davis. <laughs> That's right. Who, in addition to being governor twice, uh, you know, was a brilliant composer. Right, and, great and songwriter. And to this day sings. I don't know if you knew yes, that. Yes, I do. As he so approaches 100. Fist. Did you really? Yeah. Uh, and then uh, you decided to attend LSU. Yes. And would you tell us what you majored in? Reading and writing. <laughs> <laughs> no, you had a major. Well, no, I really was an English major an pretty English much. Major. I was I dabbled around um until I dropped out until it until music became my major but not at school. Um I I really mainly did writing classes and and English classes. When uh when did it suddenly dawn on this young lady from Vinton that I want to I want this to be my life, as it is, music. I got uh, invited to try out for a band, and I got in the band, and I really enjoyed it. But I honestly didn't know if I could get away with it, and I had jobs in addition to playing music for another five or six years. Did Even you? after I moved to Austin, I uh, worked at the University of Texas in the library, logically enough, and um, and I still had to balance my lives but then there was a point at which I realized that I could let one go and try to fly with the other one and I've never had to go back I want to ask you what may sound like an unfair question did you consider yourself because of this music this avocation this passion did you consider yourself different countercultured all of those things I've considered myself lucky because of it but yeah I mean obviously I came out of a time and place uh, where, where we were shocking our elders in the same way that these tattooed and pierced and uh, bell-bottomed kids of today are, are shocking their elders, which include me. But uh, suddenly you're an elder. Yeah, we were definitely counterculture. So you uh, decide that you're going to pursue this endeavor, this singing, and so on. Was that tough to get going? I was lucky, though. There were many. There were years of you know, un, unsuccessful gigs and, you know, less than successful bands and crying all the way home and <laughs> things like that. But um, 
I got real lucky, and actually it was a Louisiana connection in Austin that got my first break for me. I went to see a, a band play and got to talking to the drummer who was at one time Bobby Charles Guidry's roommate. Bobby Charles, who wrote See You Later, Alligator, and Walking to New Orleans. Oh, boy. This was a friend of his, and so through this connection, I got to be in that band. And that's what my big break in Austin was. Goodness. And that band launched me in Texas. And, and you began to tour? We played locally for probably three years, and then I started my own band when that broke up, and my first tour was back here. My first tour was Hammond and Lafayette. I think we played Antlers in Lafayette. Oh, and, my goodness, Antlers. <laughs> which when is I was a, a boy, we'd go there and get coffee, my father and I. Well, my daddy drank there when he was in college at SLI. SLI? <laughs> oh, are you, that's Southwestern Louisiana yeah. Institute, now the University of Southwestern. Yeah. Marcia, can uh, uh, I ask you uh, to sum up your music, and you said rhythm and blues. Yes. Would you play us something that's the essence of of Marcia, rhythm and blues? I'll play La Tida, which I wrote, but it's really about Louisiana. It's about New Orleans. Some people call me Party Dawn. Some people call me La Tida. I don't know if that's the appropriate uh, a word after a song like that. I don't think Bravo quite says it. It was wonderful. Hey, it's New what, Orleans. That's what you said. It's New Orleans. Yeah. Uh, when did it dawn on you that you might not only play and sing, but that you might compose? I got in my first band because I had written a song. I got my heart broken. I wrote a song. That's how a lot of people start writing songs. And uh, I was playing my little folk guitar and singing my little heartbroken song when some friends were there and they heard me and they asked me if I wanted to try out for their band. But then for a long time I really did covers and wrote a little bit. That song that I just played, although I had written some before, that song was on an album that was the most, the first real step I took toward really feeling like I was a songwriter. The, that album had a song called Mama's Cooking, very Louisiana oriented. The whole the album is called Gator Rhythms. And uh, there's a song called Daddy Said about a little Cajun girl that gets married real young and he, he predicts doom every step of the way. And finally in the last verse, it says, you know, he's he, the babies are bouncing on Papa's knee and Daddy said, I knew everything would turn out right. And wow. it's, it's a little Cajun tune. And Mama's Cooking is all about, you know, Mama's cooking. And, uh, so the Louisiana influence has been ferocious. Oh, it, yes, it has. I mean, I've wandered around. I did every kind of musical influence that, that people in my time and place might do. I started with folk music and then rock and roll. And when I was first in Austin, I played country music, which I love, and Western swing. But when it came time to start my own band and uh, pick my own music, I actually came down here and started gathering up records and tapes and came and found that uh, record called New Orleans Home of the Blues, Volume 2, that had all that good Irma Thomas stuff on it. She's wonderful. And, we interviewed her a few weeks ago. Yeah. And went back and started doing R&B. Now, you and Irma and another lady just did an album, Right, you? Tracy Nelson. Tracy Nelson. Yes. What's that? Can you play us something from that new album? Yeah. Yeah. I shook and used 
It's called Sing It. And you three ladies are kind of the answer to the three tenors, Pavarotti, oh, so Carreras, and Domingo. <laughs> so we've I read been that. told. <laughs> well, we're all kind of tenors ourselves. Marcia, uh, what, what's the future of you? I feel so lucky that I get to do what I do, and I only hope that I can continue to do it. And I've got mentors, I just was thinking as I was singing, of two Louisiana women who I love so much, both piano players, both singers. One is Carol Fran from uh, Lafayette, and the other is Katie Webster from Lake Charles. And they've so influenced me. I think I'm sounding more and more like Carol Fran <laughs> every day. But, you know, they're, they're a generation ahead of me or so, and I just hope that I can be where they are. How uh how did you break away from some of the for, the very strong influences such as Janis Joplin? By that I mean, how did you become you, you know, and throw off because, uh, find your own voice, I guess. Well, I think you can only do what you do. I mean, and certainly if you're going to create a career, you know, you can't make a career copying somebody else. And I give great uh, credit to all my mentors, the people, the piano playing mentorship of Professor Longhair and James Booker and Dr. John and Fats and Alan Toussaint and uh, to singers like Irma and the two women I just mentioned and Etta James. But ultimately the voice that comes out of your mouth is, is you. the one that's that you're born with. And so I, I hope to work with that. And I hope that in a small way I can add something to that legacy so that somewhere along the way somebody says, well, you know, there was so-and-so and so-and-so and... Is, is your music unabashedly passionate, romantic? In other words, do you, do you feel these things inside? I would think you would have to. Some of it is, and some of it's just downright silly. Just downright silly. <laughs> yes. I mean, I'm, I'm really not, uh, uh, I don't have an ax to grind. I, I do have, you know, message songs, and, and, I, and I do have serious songs, but I uh, also have never forgotten that it's entertainment. What do you do when you go back to Vinton now? I know you, you visit quite often, you mm -hmm. told me. Uh, my mother's there, and uh, we visit. I've still got friends that uh, I went to kindergarten with you know and on up and last time or last uh, fall when I was there I said I haven't been down the old highway in a long time that was cut off when Interstate 10 came through that highway through the swamp that ended at the Sabine River and we drove down there and I tell you I have not seen anything so beautiful in a long time lily pads this big water hyacinths on stalks this tall cypress is draped with moss it's as pretty a piece of marsh as you'll ever see I love your love of Louisiana. I, I, I really like that. You know, I, I, I've interviewed people in the 16 years we've done this program who just as soon not remember uh, uh, where they come from. Now, when you finally retire, will you live in, in, in Austin? I think so. That's where you got your so. real start. Well, it's where my home is. It's where my son is. It's where, you know, my, many of my friends are. And one of the advantages of uh, Austin was always that it was close enough to Louisiana, I can come back. <laughs> I can touch base real easily. Is your son musical? Well, he plays the drums. He does. There's a, there are a lot of jokes about that, <laughs> about whether that means he's musical or not. But um, he plays the drums, he plays a little trumpet, and he likes music a lot. Would you like him to take it on as a profession? Yeah, I mean, I think it's a wonderful life. I, you know, I had every form of encouragement and every form of discouragement about this. You know, everybody said, you can't make it, you need something to fall back on. 
and yet it's it's led me to this wonderful life. How if he suited handle, for it, I wanted to do it. How did you handle discouragement? Because quite often when that feeling came over you, I'm sure you were on the road someplace or by yourself. Uh, uh, oh, how did yeah. you? Ha how do you handle discouragement? Well, you go to the next gig. Usually that always cheers me up. The gig will cheer me up. I mean, being broken down in a truck stop in the rain in Arkansas wow. is depressing. And then you think, oh, well, you know, so-and-so's on the bus, on their bus asleep, and I'm standing here. But when you get to the next gig... What? You, you get to the next gig? And you, uh, and you play, and then it's fun again. Is, is your music also healing to you? Very much. Uh, literally healing. I can get on stage feeling hmm. about... 50% come off feeling 125. How about when you're at home? Do you get pleasure out of just sitting down and, and playing? Yes, I do, but unfortunately, I, I travel so much that I'm home so little that instead of um, relaxing and playing piano, I tend to do minor plumbing repairs. <laughs> <laughs> Don't tell us those unglamorous things. <laughs> Please leave the illusion be. <laughs> right. uh, okay, I garden. You do garden? <laughs> no. What kind yeah. of cook at all? Oh, yeah. You but I'm cook? married to a good cook. So, oh, really? Uh, so I've gotten lazy. But yeah, Cajun I'm fooder. I, I'm a good Cajun food cook, but I taught him how to do that, too. So. Uh, Where'd you meet him? In Austin. He's a rare person. He's a, a native Austinite. And uh, we met. He, he had seen me play, and he got somebody to introduce us. Wow. It's a second marriage for, yes. for me and for him. How long have you been married now? Fifteen years. Oh, my. I think it's going to work. I think it's going to work. <laughs> After 15 years, if you haven't choked each other, right. like, yeah, it, it, it will work. <laughs> Marcia, uh, when all of this is over, and, and how, how would you like to be remembered? Well, I hope, as I said, that I can add a little something to what is called Louisiana culture, what people think of as, as Louisiana culture. And then hopefully I can do some good for somebody, and that's... Your answer doesn't surprise me. You know what I would love for you to play is Randy Newman's Louisiana 1929 and sing it. Because as I told you a little earlier, Randy Newman, who's not a Louisianian at all... He's born here. He, he was born here? I didn't know that. I don't know why I thought of him as a Californian. Born in New Orleans. Really? Had family uh, down here. Would you... Uh, would you sing and play yeah. that for us? I'm just going to skip the little intro because I played yes, it. Yes, ma'am. What has happened down here? So the wind has changed. The clouds rolled in from the north and it started to rain. It rained real hard and it rained for a real long time. There was six feet of water the streets of Evangeline The river rolls all day The river rolls all night Some people got lost in the flood Some people got away all right Now the river broke through Way down in Plaquemine Six feet of water in the streets of Evangeline. Louisiana, Louisiana, they're trying to wash us away. They're trying to wash us away. eloquent and coming out of that smoky voice and and I hope you don't hate that description no, it's, okay. it, it, it's you though to me uh, my goodness uh, that's that's the best I've ever heard that song in other words I, I if I ever run into Randy Newman I'd say I know somebody who sings your song plays your song better than you well I hope he doesn't 
you know, smacky one. Where, where do you go from here, New Orleans, where we're taping this? The um, tour that we're starting here with Irma and Tracy is a two-week tour up the East Coast with a, and across to the Midwest with a lot of really fun stops. We're doing um, public radio in West Virginia, Mountain Stage. We're doing uh, festivals in Charlotte and Birmingham. Uh, in Minneapolis and in Ann Arbor, Michigan. Uh, and then I meet with my guys on the 4th of July. We play at the Washington Monument on the 4th of July, live on NPR. Bravo. We'll be, we'll be, we'll be listening Good. and watching. Good. I, I hope so. And Marcia, thank you so much. You're a, uh, you're a lovely lady and your talent is just quite extraordinary. Thank you very much. Would you Thanks play as we me. go out? And Sure. Thank you. Louisiana Legends is made possible by Blue Cross and Blue Shield of Louisiana. This important program series enables us to discover, through the accomplishments of our fellow Louisianians, the unique character of a state so proudly served by Blue Cross and Blue Shield of Louisiana for 60 years. For a copy of this program, call 1-800-973-7246 or send 1995 to Louisiana Legends, care of LPB. 7733 Perkins Road, Baton Rouge, Louisiana, 70810. Please allow four to six weeks for delivery.